be lifted up. Lord God, may our faith be strengthened. Speak to us, Lord. The good shepherd, come now. Feed us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. A Christian leader by name Gordon MacDonald, some of you may have heard his name, pastor, founding pastor of Lexington Church, right in uh, Grace, uh, Grace Chapel, Lexington. Uh, he shared a, a story, the following story, about how God transformed his view on giving from as something an institutional obligation to a cheerful giving. So God did some work there. How did that happen? He goes to sh share about the process of that. Him and his wife, Gail, they both went on a mission trip to West Africa. So on the first Sunday of our visit, he recalls, we joined a large crowd of desperately poor Christians for worship. As we neared the church, I noticed that almost every member was carrying something with them to the church. Some were carrying some cages of chicken. Some were carrying this, uh, uh, you know, the banana bunch. And some were carrying this basket full of eggs. And others were uh, cassava paste. And all these things they brought into the church. So Josh was wondering what was, uh, uh, Gordon McDonald was wondering what was going on. So he turned to somebody and says, I asked one of our hosts, why are they bringing all this stuff? Watch, he said. So almost every person in that African congregation brought something. A chicken, a basket of yam, yams, or a bowl of cassava paste. I saw that giving, whether yams or dollars, is not optional for Christ followers. Not optional. Soon after the worship began, the moment came when everyone stood and poured into the aisles, singing and clapping and even shouting. They, they were beginning to bring all their food they brought with them into, a, into the front of the church, and then they began to dance and, and then wor worship. He says, I bought it. This was West African offering time. The chickens would help others get a tiny farm business started. The yams and the, uh, and the eggs could be sold in the marketplace to help the needy. The cassava paste would guarantee lunch for somebody who's hungry. I was captivated. I had never seen a joyful offering before. My keep money under the radar policy <laughs> would not have worked in this West African church. Those African believers, although they never knew it, had moved me. I understood that giving, whether yams or dollars, was not option for Christ followers. Instead, it was an indication of the direction and the tenor of one's whole life. What a lesson for him to learn, to go all the way up to West Africa to have this perspective shaped. You know, in Malden, when we were a part of a church there, Whenever the offering time comes, there's one member, who, she would shout, hallelujah, good time now, time to give, right? She was, she would just, she would get so elated, joyful. So maybe uh, we should practice the West African uh, way of giving in our uh, worship services, right? Right? Well, at least if not the, the items, at least let's catch the spirit of giving. They are, they knew, with little, with, maybe they had little, but they brought to honor God with that. So today we will learn about these principles from another church uh, in, in the first century, looking at the believers from these particular uh, re, uh, churches in the, in, the, in the region of Macedonia. Uh, and the Apostle Paul had to bring them to teach the Corinthian church some lessons about giving. You know, no one likes to be compared with someone else, right? But here, Paul was making that comparison. Okay, look at them. 
look at yourself. So for the past several weeks, we have been drawing lessons from Corinthian church for, the, uh, for how we can apply, how to be the church and how to do the church and how, or how not to in some cases as well. So here Paul was using the examples of Macedonian churches. Now what do we know about the Macedonian Christians? We heard often, right? Some people, whenever people want to talk about the gener generosity, we talk about Macedonian churches. Who are they? What are these people like? How did this all begin? If you look at book of Acts, uh, 16th chapter, remember Paul had a vision. In that vision, he saw a man from Macedonia. Remember that vision? He's saying that, oh, come and help us with the gospel. Come and preach to us. So in response to that uh, vision, Paul uh, uh, went over to this region. Uh, it is uh, northern uh, Greece, Macedonia, northern Greece at that time. And he began to preach the good news of the gospel. As a result of his uh, preaching of the gospel, there were three churches, at least we could name, were planted. These were, these were the uh, uh, church in Philippi, the Philippian church, we call it. Our church in Berea. We talk about the Berean Christians, how they eagerly read the Bible. Remember the scriptures, Ber Berean Christians there. And then also there's another church called Thessalonians, Thessalonians or Thessalonica in the city, uh, one of those major cities of, of, of that region, Thessalonica. Thessalonica. So Paul here, uh, to, to give us an idea, what was, what was it like? Macedonia was an impoverished province that many wars had ravaged. It was plundered by Roman authority and commerce. And the Christians were persecuted and they were living in abject poverty. Yet the believers in those churches displayed uh, a beautiful spirit of generosity. And Paul here wanted the Corinthian believers to know that the grace of God was the one that, was, that motivated these Macedonian churches. In verse 2, if you read that verse, say, say they, are, uh, they are being tested by many trouble and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy which overflowed in rich generosity. If you look at that verse itself, it is very, uh, uh, what do you call it, it's paradoxical, right? Like, how could poor people be rich in generosity? Or how could the troubles uh, be filled with great exceeding joy? You know, it doesn't make sense, right? But that's what actually is happening here. Uh, let me bring it to us, for example, uh, 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 and into our context. When somebody is making, say, over $100,000 per year for him or her to give $100 towards charity is no big deal. Right? Isn't it? $100,000? Yeah, it's $100. But what if somebody who is living on food stamps, not having enough money, but scrapes that money together somehow and gives that same $100 towards Salvation Army or towards uh, Voice of the Martyrs, some charity? That is admirable. So that's what exactly happening here from the churches in, in Macedonia. The poor, but yet they were rich in giving. The trouble, but they were filled with joy. And uh, because their circumstances did not control their giving, neither they dictate, dictate their giving. Circumstances didn't play into, into, into their giving. And we saw some very un unusual uh, practices of giving uh, mentioned here in the churches of Macedonia. Uh, uh, I was kind of fascinated as I was studying that one. What are they? Uh, it says, they gave what they could afford to give, right? That sounds like a reasonable giving. But they went beyond, it says, they gave beyond their ability to give. Hmm, that is something strange, rather something 
Wow, it's called faith giving. I don't have the money, but I want to give $500. Wow, where do I get it from? I'm not going to steal somewhere, but I'm trusting the Lord somehow God would give me. So kind of a faith giving, that is. They gave beyond than what they could afford to give. How often do we see such qualities among people these days in our, in the, in our time? Something strange else, strange is happening here. It says, they repeatedly begged the apostles for the privilege of sharing the gift with the believers in Jerusalem. Sometimes, you know, when somebody appeals for, uh, uh, for uh, from donations and all that, we will be so uh, strict and stiff and say, oh, they're after my money. You know, that's what uh, sometimes my, uh, my daughter, uh, Sarah, tells me, uh, you know, if she gets a, a letter for donations from Boston Trinity Academy, she would say, oh, they're after my money. Well, you know, she, she could say that little. She's, she didn't have much. But we can be so tight-fisted. And, but here, what they're saying, they're, they're begging, please, please, could you give me that privilege of giving you, serving you? How many of us take that sort of a posture of begging? But they, not once, repeatedly, they begged, it says, the the, the apostles for a, just an opportunity or a privilege of sharing the gift with the believers in Jerusalem. What was going on? Why they wanted to share with the believers in Jerusalem? Jerusalem, that's ex- from Acts 11, chapter 27 and 30. If you read, there was a severe famine in that region, right? In the whole Roman province was severely affected by famine. There's no... Uh, um, uh, food and food shortage and all that. And here, these people, they're saying, we want to send gifts. We want to send some help to our brothers, believers in that area. The Macedonian believers and others gave as much as possible and beyond their ability to help the poor saints in Jerusalem. That's why we call them the poor Christians, yet rich in Macedonian believers, why did they do that? Because they saw it not only a privilege to give, but they also saw it was their duty to give. It was their obligation to give. Why so? There were two things playing out, privilege as well as an obligation to give. What was going on? Turn with me to Romans 15th chapter to to put that together. 15th chapter, 26 to 27. In Romans, uh, it says, for you, for you see, the believers in Macedonia and uh, Achaia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news, from the believers in Jerusalem, now they feel the least they can do in return is help them financially. Now seeing that they, because they received the gospel, the, the valuable gift of salvation that came out from Jerusalem, right? It went from Jerusalem. You remember from there it all began spreading to the rest of the world. Now they were enlightened. They received the, the truth of the gospel. And now they heard about the difficulties and the, the hardships that the believers were going on, uh, uh, facing in that region, in, in Jerusalem. They said, hey, let's take up an offering. Let's collect something to help these people. I see that sometimes happening here in, in America, right? When somebody is struggling in some places, we, what, what do we do? We rally around. We, we gather people to, to, uh, uh, to give towards the hurting people. So that's the, they saw it a privilege as well as they saw it as an obligation. In verse 5, gives us, we'll, we'll see what was the uh, uh, cause, what made the Macedonian Christians to excel in joy and in giving. Let's look at that. Verse 5, uh, if you can uh, follow. The, they even did more than we had hoped. For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us 
just as God wanted them to do. They exceeded the apostles' ex ex uh, expectations here. See, what did, how did they do that? What was the two actions there? The first action was what? They gave themselves to the Lord first. Now listen to me carefully here. Every giving, whatever the form of giving, always begins with you giving yourself to the Lord first. Amen? You give yourself to the Lord from there. Why? Because the Lord gave himself for us. Amen? It is the same, it's, it's appropriate response for us to give ourselves to the Lord fully. And then from there, other things could uh, follow. And he said, they gave themselves to the Lord first and then to what? That's the second, second, second uh, uh, response. So that's what God wanted us to do. God is not interested in your money. God is not interested in all your, what you can bring to him. First and foremost, he's interested in what? In you and in me. When you come to him, and the second thing, what he would tell us is, help the others. What does the Bible say? Love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and then love your, complete the sentence, love your neighbor as yourself. So the same principle is here. Give yourself unto the Lord first. And then the Lord says, that's not enough. That's not enough. Yeah, great, you did that. You come and worship and lift up your hands and praise the Lord and all that. But can you see the needs of your brothers and sisters of the same faith? How are we fulfilling the second part of giving to others? That's what God wanted us to do. The both ways, vertical and the horizontal giving is taking place here. So what, what happens when we give to God? Do we become poor? Right? We don't become poor. You know? You know, we, because uh, in the first place, we all what we have, God, it comes from Him. You know, He says, God to test me by coming and giving it to Him. We, we give ourselves, uh, 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 then we don't become poor, but there's something happen to us. You know, something in our deep, deep down in our hearts happens. What will happen is that few things. We will recognize saying that, Lord, all I have, all I have comes from you. Do you say amen for that? Your very breath today is a borrowed breath from God. So you have no, you have no uh, say on that. When that would be taken away from you and me. And as long as we have breath, what we do? We will praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says. All that has breath in them, praise the Lord. So all that we have, Lord, it's yours. Who am I? What my all my properties, everything belongs to you. And then we say, Lord, you are the Lord of my whole life, including my checkbook. Do you say hallelujah for that? Some people say, oh, no, 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 not that one. Just don't go over there. <laughs> I'll give you everything else. No, 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 no. That's everything is, including Lord, everything is yours. Are we willing to say that to the Lord? How many? Do that today, willingly say, Lord, you're Lord of all of my life. That, that is acknowledging the, the Lordship of Christ. And uh, giving yourself to the Lord, and then the, se and the third thing here is we see, he's that seeing the needs of God's people. Like, for example, here, it says, when we serve God and the needs of God's people, God will meet our needs in, in return. Uh, uh, there's a principle that we can draw from the scriptures here. Again, from another church from uh, the Corinthians. Uh, for example, turn with me to Philippians, uh, uh, book of Philippians, uh, fourth chapter. Uh, don't put the scripture there already. Just let me, let us point out to some things here. Um, all righty. Philippians 4th chapter, verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And this same God who takes care of me 
will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Just look at that. My God, uh, uh, John, you just sang that song. What does that say? My God shall supply all my needs. Sometimes we, we take the scripture and then speak these things like cliches. My God shall supply all your needs and we will sing, right? Yes, that is true. But when do you think that God supplying our needs will happen? Does it happen just automatically? According to this particular pa uh, verse? Well, it, yes, he's able to supply all our needs. But in this context, there is something else happening here. What is it happening here? For example, that's where I want us to see from verse 15 onwards. Let's come back to 15 now. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financially financial help when I first brought you the good news and, the, and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I do not say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with the Epaphrodites. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, hear it. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. What is the principle there here? You Philippians, he was writing to the church in Philippi, right? When I was in need, you met me. Nobody came, but you met me. You saw my needs. But even when I was in Thessalonica, more than once you sent me the gift to take care of me. And now my God will take care of your needs. Amen? So what's happening here? The principle is when we take care of the needs of God's people, God will take care of our needs. I've seen that happening over and over again in YWAM. Uh, we experience God's provision coming to us. Uh, and as we also reciprocally begin to serve others and begin to uh, uh, give uh, uh, to meet the other people's needs, God began to meet our needs. Because there is a principle here. What is that principle? It says here, uh, Proverbs 7, chapter verse 25, the generous will prosper. Listen to this. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Do you want to be refreshed? How many of you would like to be refreshed? We all want to be refreshed. Yo, come, refresh me, 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 right? I need, 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 need. Get, give me, 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 me. Sometimes we, we are in a mode of what? Getting, 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 getting. <laughs> what do I get, 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 right? We all want to be refreshed. The principle is here is that if you refresh others, you will be refreshed. Give it to others. You know, meet others. That's what Jesus, he, 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 uh, others, others focus. He washed the disciples' feet and all that. You know, Proverbs principle is beautiful. It says, when we meet the needs of God's people, God will supply all our needs from his glorious riches. There was another, another story we can see uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, Elish, uh, you know, Elijah. Remember, he was uh, 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 having this situation where um, there's a famine there. Uh, he was sent into the household of uh, 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 a widow uh, Zareph, uh, in Zarephath. Remember that story? And what did she say? You know, she was going to get the, uh, she was going to get the, uh, collect the wood and all that. And then, uh, and then she says, uh, well, we are going to, uh, 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 we are going to, going to eat and die. You know, he says that's what, that's what she says. And then what did uh, Elijah say? You get me a bread first. You would get me. Give me. Sometimes we think, well, well, he's very selfish here. He doesn't care about the needs of this widow and uh, that lady. If you look at that principle story, beautiful. Read that passage. But then she said, okay, I will do this. And when she did that, the prophet was blessed. The widow was blessed. 
and the sun was red, and there was a lot of, uh, 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 for the whole family. So there's a principle for here we need to learn in the area of when we go give to God and give to God's people, you know, God will take care of our needs. So these are some of these lessons I believe the Corinthian church needed to l learn. A lot were going on good for them. They were good in many ways. Paul acknowledged that, you know, but there were something, they were, they, they were having some uh, inadequacies there, especially when it comes to giving. It looked like the Corinthian church was doing well in many ways. Their scripture knowledge was great, like our Bible times. Their faith, love for the apostles, and enthusiasm, and also they've got a lot of gifted speakers. Well, I tell our church has a lot of gifted speakers too, right? You know, and yet they were lacking in the area of generous giving. So that's where Paul is appealing to them that they should grow in the grace of giving. That's the title for this message, the, the grace of giving. Now, why did Paul associate giving with grace? Grace and giving, why is that? What is the connection there? There is so much connection there because one of the earliest revelations of God to Moses was in uh, Exodus 34, chapter verse 6, it says one of the way he revealed himself is he's a God of compassion and all that it says, but he was God of love and grace. So that's what God is. God is love and his God is gracious and everything he does is motivated out of love and grace. That's what, that's what motivates him. When God said uh, he wanted to love the world, what did he say in John 3.16? For he, God so loved the world, did he stop at the, the word saying, I love you, I love the world? No. What did he do? He gave. So he was motivated to give his, because of love, motivated him to give. And then what did Jesus do? Because he loved us, what did he, what did he do? Out of his love, he gave his life for us on the cross. So we have a pattern to follow. If you love the Lord, we got to be excelling in this grace of giving. That's what Paul's uh, uh, exhortation for us here uh, uh, today. You know, because God set that as a, as a, as a model for us. Uh, Romans 12, chapter verse uh, uh, 6, for example, if you read, uh, God, out of grace, it says, in his grace, God gave us uh, uh, many gifts, several gifts that he gave us to do things well. So here, grace giving is something we need to be practicing. What does it, how does it work here in our lives? Number one, first of all, you and I don't give or we don't give out of compulsion and guilt. Oh, I'm not giving enough guilt. Or nobody, you know, nobody's forcing us to give. There are some churches I, I, uh, I know. They have a lot of, put, they put a lot of pressure on people to, to give. If you don't give, this will happen, that will happen, this will happen, and all that. Uh, or uh, they have these uh, stewardship uh, uh, um, uh, weeks or months and putting a lot of pressure uh, on people in, and giving in the area of giving. But here Paul was saying we don't give out of compulsion or out of, out of guilt, but we give because out of our love for God. Because we love him. So that's where we, because we give, because he gave his life for us. So we give, do not, we don't give out of compulsion, but out of our free will. No one is forcing us to give, but we give freely. Thirdly, we give not grudgingly, but cheerfully. You know, the West African believers, where there's so much of, so much of noise going on, dancing and going forward, then we should do that next time when we are having this, and then we'll, we'll uh, volume up a little bit and uh, dance. Uh, joyfully, we can bring our offerings to the Lord. Or, 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 or give ourselves, not grudgingly. Why do we do that? Because that's what God expects of us. We will talk about it maybe another time. Um, so we don't give out of 
uh, of guilt or out of uh, grudgingly, but cheerfully. Yeah, we give cheerfully because the Lord blesses a cheerful giver, it says. Uh, there are two forms of giving I'd like to touch right now, and then, then we'll move on to maybe we'll pick it up again at another point. But that these two primary ways of giving are mentioned in the Bible. They are among many others. These are tithe and free will offering. That's what we do. We, every Sunday we try to bring that concept of tithe. What is tithe? And what is free will offering? Well, tithe, according to the Bible dictionary, uh, Smith's Bible dictionary, it says, a tithe or a tenth is the proportion of property devoted to the religious uses from very early times. There is a tenth of our income, tenth of the properties, the tenth of the, the produce of the, from the field or, or, or the cattle in the, in the Old Testament that was required by God to bring it to the temple. Why? Because what, when it's brought into the temple, they, that, that would be used to meet various needs of the maintenance of the temple, uh, uh, taking care of the priestly family, the Levites, or uh, uh, using the, you know, to put the, the lights on. You know, they have to, temple they need to have lights, right? The oil needs to be there, and the, the wicks, and the lamp stands, and all that, and the, and the gates, and all those things need to be in place. All that maintenance would come from that particular uh, po uh, uh, pool, even more so the, the families of the Levites, uh, because they didn't have any uh, inheritance on the land, the portion. God made that provision uh, in that way. So what happens when we give 10% of our income, my income, which Wilma and I, we have been practicing that uh, uh, from uh, very, very early. Uh, even when I was a, uh, in YWAM, I, I used to do uh, very methodically this practicing of 10%. If somebody gives me a gift of $100, let's say, the first thing I would do was to te put 10% of that, $10 away. I, I used to have uh, a, a, a tithe cover. Uh, in that cover, I keep putting it out. And then from that, I would go to church and give or, or to help some people who are in need. So 10% of our income, we bring it to the local church. That's where we are being fed or being encouraged, be, uh, uh, supported in a family. So we use that when that comes in uh, to maintain this facility, right? Tom, we can... Uh, can use some money to get this upkeep of this building or to pay the salaries, the pastor or the janitor, whoever uh, may be salaried in the church setting. Uh, and also we provide for the poor that are among us or the needy, uh, or we support that uh, local missions or uh, our missionaries abroad so that the gospel will continue to be preached. So that is tithe. And free will offerings are Anything above tithing, after giving the 10%, then we will have bring some other gifts of offerings whenever there was a need. Say, uh, there's a need in Dominican Republic. You know, we say, uh, we'd like to support that. And then we give some free will offerings or towards uh, a deacon's fund or uh, for some special causes and so on. So these are some things that, two, uh, two of the ways we could use in uh, 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 growing in uh, in giving, especially in the area of tithing, that's something uh, we need to be paying attention to. Uh, some churches don't talk about it. We now I I don't major on that, but it's a great principle that we follow from the Bible. Uh, t t uh, do do you remember when was tithing first appeared in the Bible? Can anyone think? Abraham, what did Abraham do, Serena? King Melchizedek, right? Yeah, he was, uh, you know, in Genesis 14th chapter. Sometimes we say tithing is the Old Testament law, therefore we are free from the law, so we don't practice. Right, Jeff, what do you think? Did, did, uh, did Jesus completely take the tithing away? No, right, he did not. Yeah, he, we, we expanded even to, to give, not 10%, give your whole self, 100%, everything that we have. Uh, 
Uh, so if, if tithing was practiced even way before the law was introduced, uh, uh, so Abraham was the first one, and Jesus would also continue to say, well, you do all these things, uh, uh, tithing, yes, that's good, but along with the tithing, also be involved in justice aspects or other merciful mercy aspects and all that. So let's, if you have not been in the practice of tithing, let's continue, let's work on that. We could talk more about it. But I tell you, God would bless us when we when we give to the Lord uh, to begin with tithing. You know, the ten percent of what we have, because all what we have is His. But this is the final thing I would like to close with. It is not how much you give, or it is not what you give, or how much you give, but what is your attitude. How is how do you give? Do you give? Oh, I have to give. The, the the offering plate is coming, so I have to put something. No, you don't have to put anything. You know, it that's what it says. You know, everybody must give what as what they have decided. So tithing is a good principle that we follow, but it is not these commandments that that are essential commandments uh, in comes to salvation. There are there are commandments that are called uh, 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 essential, you know, what do you call these uh, some doctrines. There's an essential doctrine. Salvation is one. Salvation does not come anywhere else, only through through uh, through Jesus Christ. But there are other non-essentials. It could fall into that category. But there is a beautiful principle that we could apply. Uh, uh, start of making that as a habit when we do that. That would uh, God would help us. That we will grow in the grace of giving. Is with everything else we will grow in that. So, how many of us would like to grow in the grace of giving? Right. We have plenty of opportunities to grow in that. God has given us that. You know, then to or start bringing our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. But this this brings questions to us. Few more other. It raises some more questions. It says. Does God need our money? Uh, what are the other ways of giving besides giving money? Uh, what happens when we don't practice giving? Some of these questions we can talk about at another time. But this is what I want to close with. Giving helps me and us overcome three things. Selfishness. Greed and discontentment. When we begin to give to others, I'm not thinking about myself. Oh, greed. Greed is idolatry. More, more, more. I want to have more, more, more things. But when we start giving, we can overcome. And discontentment. Oh, I don't have this, that, and all. But you have Jesus that can bring contentment to you. So let's practice giving during this during this season of giving. So would you stand up together as we are offering ourselves to the Lord, first and foremost, as a, a living sacrifices unto the Lord, and as the Lord shows different um, uh, ways and uh, opportunities, we will grow in giving in the gracious. Let's excel in that. So John, what do you have for us?
There's nothing like you, Lord. 